Athletic Crusaders, happy Monday. Hope you had a great weekend. Welcome back to it. It's all getting very, very exciting as we approach uh, Super Tuesday coming up on March 3rd. But we got to start here. Did you see Trump at the Daytona 500? It was awesome. Check it out. The second running of the great American race, along with Jeff Gordon, Jamie McMurray. I'm Chris Myers, and nice to have you along with us for this special moment. I have been to a lot of Daytona 500s, Chris. Never have I felt the excitement and energy. We've had great racing on the track, but we've got the president landing right now. The fans are pumped up. I mean, wow, what a day. It's one of the most incredible things I've ever seen to, to see. They said that plane's 800 feet above the racetrack right now. What an entrance by the president of the United States. He's the grand marshal. He'll give the command. Presidents, of course, have attended NASCAR races Daytona before, but again, the first to give the command for this, the Daytona 500. And, you know, I just can't... I go into the mindset of these competitors and what they're going through. And Historic visit from President Donald J. Trump as Air Force One descended upon the scene here in Daytona Beach. And we're going to hear from the president a little bit later. This is more than a race. This is a major happening. It's one of the great spectacles in all of sports, and we're just getting started. I don't care who you are. That's awesome. <laughs> that is good stagecraft. I found out that Trump was going to Daytona on Saturday. I read this Jesse Kelly tweet. He said, Trump going to NASCAR is, and I saw that, I was like, wait, he's going to NASCAR? Trump going to NASCAR is A, brilliant politics, and two, an obvious bear trap for the media. <laughs> One, they'll no doubt charge into at full speed. And sure enough, tons of tweets popping up. Uh, this one, this is from some woman. Uh, she's a senior political reporter at the American Independent, which is some super progressive magazine. And she said, you thought an event couldn't get any trashier, and then, talking about the president coming, right? So, and walking right into that bear trap. It is us versus them, city versus country, rural versus urban, uh, elite versus real America, coasts versus the flyover. It's, it's the same thing, right? Oh, just when you thought NASCAR couldn't get any trashier, then the president should. That was like all that stuff. City versus country, that was the 2016 election in a nutshell. And we talk about that a lot on this show because it's an ancient theme. It goes back to an Aesop's fable thousands of years ago, city mouse versus rural mouse, and the principles are the exact still same today. And the Dems are running full speed ahead into that same trap. The worst candidate when it comes to this elite versus NASCAR fan. <laughs> Everybody, you see that economy with me? The worst candidate for this. And now each Democratic candidate has a major weakness against Trump. But the worst when it comes to elite versus the people is Mayor Bloomberg. So his strategy has been and is he stays out of the first few primaries and debates, just stay out of the whole thing completely. Why? Because he's terrible at debating. And why take a bunch of punches when you don't need to? Why, why, get, in, why get in this whole melee early on when everyone's just going to get beat up? Just stay out of it. And then swoop in after the pointless primaries come in on Super Tuesday, which is March 3rd. It's Alabama, Arkansas, uh, California, Colorado, Maine, Massachusetts, Minnesota, North Carolina, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Texas, Utah, Vermont, and Virginia. A lot of states, ton of delegates, particularly from California and Texas. So why swoop in on that day? Because you're the only person, Bloomberg is, who can afford ads in every expensive media market, particularly in California and Texas. You win those two states, and you're magically the front runner out of nowhere. It's a really smart strategy, but only if you have a ton of money, which only Michael Bloomberg has. And we'll get to that in a minute. But who's more elitist than Michael Bloomberg? We played a clip last week of him speaking at the Oxford Business School about how we, the intelligentsia, that's what he said. He said, we, the intelligentsia, and people smart enough to be in this room, all right? And then he goes on to this whole thing about how only progressives understand the nuance of arguments. And the example he gave was, the nuance of arguments for allowing men into women's bathrooms and boys into your daughter's locker rooms. And he said, we get it, but good luck explaining that to the rubes of Wisconsin, right? So that, there's your elitist perspective. Meanwhile, you got President Trump flying in on Air Force One to the Daytona 500. <laughs> you think the people at the Daytona 500 are gonna vote for the condescending elitist over President Trump? Give me a break. Last week, we did a whole analysis on the importance of being authentic. 
Uh, that's Elizabeth Warren's Achilles heel, if you'll remember. We broke that all down, right? She's the one who comes across as a total phony. Remember we played that Instagram Live where she's like, oh, hello, husband, in the kitchen. So glad you're here. I'm really glad you're here, honey. You want to grab a beer? Like, what? If there's anything worse than being inauthentic, it's being an elitist. An elitist who, I don't know, won't let you drink soda. Actual quote from Michael Bloomberg. This is in 2012. This was about the soda ban that he did in uh, uh, New York. Was it like he banned all sodas above whatever, a certain number of ounces, 32 ounces or something like that. He said, people aren't good at describing what is in their best interest. Could there be a more elitist line than that? <laughs> really? People aren't good. The little people, the regular people, people aren't good at describing what's in their own interest. But I'm good. I'm good at telling you what's in your best interest. Vote for me and I'll force you to do what I know is best for you. Like, that, 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 that's the definition of elitist, isn't it? Let's camp out on Bloomberg here for a minute and what Bloomberg is doing. He's getting a pass on this strategy now because I don't, I don't think most people, I don't think most people see it because it's never been done before. But before you know it, it's going to be July and the Democratic Convention, and everyone's going to say, "Wait, how, what? <laughs> Bloomberg? How did? When did he? How did he do?" So let's give a little perspective. I talked about money. I mentioned it quickly earlier. Trump's net worth is th about three billion dollars. A lot of money. Three billion dollars. Bloomberg's net worth, 63 billion, all right? This is, like a, this is like orders of magnitude more money than Trump. The 2008 campaign, just for a little perspective on all this, 2008 campaign, presidential campaign, John McCain spent $333 million. Obama spent $700 million. But obviously, both of those were record amounts back in 2008, okay? So McCain, a measly, $330 million, Obama, $700 million. 2016, Trump raised him, his campaign, and through super PACs, $650 million. Okay, they spent $650. Hillary lost with $1.2 billion. Okay, so that's, so he's, that's what history has given us. All right, $1.2 billion is by far the most. Bloomberg's already spent, and by already, I mean he's been doing this for like two weeks. He's already spent over $400 million in the primary. So Bloomberg has spent more in the primary in the last few weeks in just a few states, more, almost more, no, no, more, than John McCain spent in the entire presidential race in all the states. Isn't that crazy? And by March 3rd, he'll probably spend more than Trump did in 2016 in the primary. Again, Bloomberg's net worth $63 billion. He can truly, I'm not exaggerating, he buy the presidency. And it's so bizarre because the Democrats, you know, they talk all the time about campaign finance reform and the influence of money in politics. Are you kidding me? Your front runner has a net worth of $63 billion and he's using it. Blake Zeff, he uh, used to work for Democratic campaigns against Bloomberg. So Blake Zeff is a Democrat. Uh, and he, he went, he laid out in detail how Bloomberg was able to get all these key Democratic endorsements when he was running for mayor of New York City. By the way, a little background on, on Bloomberg. He was a Democrat. Then when he ran for mayor in New York City, he ran as a Republican in 2001. Now, and he was endorsed by Giuliani. He was like the follow to, to wrap up Giuliani's term. And this was uh, this is a side story, but I, I wonder if Bloomberg would have won if it weren't for 9-11. The Republican primaries were scheduled on 9-11, 2001. And his whole campaign after that was things are, everything's chaotic and we need a businessman with experience. And then again, he decided to run as a Republican after, at that time, super popular Giuliani, right? So anyway, so he was, he was a Democrat, then he ran as a Republican, but how did he get key Democratic endorsements? Just an example, there's a pastor at a church in Harlem who chose not to endorse his longtime friend, an ally for mayor, he instead endorsed Bloomberg. He betrayed his friend and endorsed Bloomberg. Why? Bloomberg donated a million dollars to the church's development corporation. It was 10% of its budget with the promise to donate more. And the pastor said, what could I say to a man who is supportive of a lot of programs that are important to me? That's what was, that was his response. And you think, okay, so I don't know. maybe he really believed in the mission. So he gave money to someone for an endorsement, okay? It's not like he can do that for, I don't know, an entire presidential election 
Yes, he can. He is. He's trying. Bloomberg gave two point. Check this from the Washington Post. Bloomberg gave two point two million dollars to two different congressmen. Four point five million dollars to a third. They've all sh shockingly endorsed Bloomberg for president. In 2018, he spent $110 million on 24 candidates that are now in Congress. As, as, as Blake Zepp said, uh, it turns out giving people $2 million can be the start of a beautiful friendship. Do you remember all the talk from the, about the Clinton Foundation during the last election, right? All the corruption from the Clinton Foundation. And by the way, has anyone ever looked into how many uh, donations the Clinton Foundation is receiving now? <laughs> now that there's no uh, Clinton in power or hope of Clinton in power anymore, I'm guessing their donations have dropped off quite a bit. Clinton Foundation, that was very 2016. Uh, now there's a group called the Bloomberg Philanthropies, and they give money to uh, cities. So, uh, hey, mayors, do you want a nice grant from Bloomberg Philanthropies? You know what to do. Do you want to know the... This is the example of Bloomberg's ego. He changed the term limits law in New York City. In New York City, you could only run for two, you could only be mayor for two terms. He changed the law and then ran for a third term. Are you kidding me? You know the, the theory that we're working with right now is that the Democrats are running their version of who they think Trump is. Right? The Democrats have become so consumed with hatred for Trump for so long, they've become him, and they're running their version of Trump, of what they think Trump is. Right? Biden is, is the thin-skinned guy who insults women and challenges people to fights. How often, how many times have we heard the fear-mongering from the left that if Trump loses this election, he won't leave the White House? He won't leave. He'll be, he's, he's an emperor. He's a king forever. Well, Bloomberg changed the law in New York City so he could stick around for a third term. You're going to hear this word, megalomaniac, to describe Bloomberg. He is a megalomaniac. That's it, right? He changed the law. He's like, I'm the only man who can do this job. We're going to change the law so I can run again. That's amazing. So how did he get support? That's why I bring this up. How did he get support for that law to change? There's something called the Doe Fund in, uh, in New York City. It's a homeless charity in New York City. And they, can't, they campaign big time to get uh, that law changed in New York City. This is the New York Times, August 6th, 2010. The Doe Fund officials' appearance appear amounted to a clear conflict of interest. Appearance at the uh, city council meetings to try to advocate for him to run for a third, to be allowed to run for a third term. For one thing, the organization, which has provided help to the homeless for a quarter century, has been awarded tens of millions of dollars in city contracts. But what was unknown in the fall of 2008 was just how much the Doe Fund has benefited from Mr. Bloomberg's personal philanthropy. Right after 20 employees from the Doe Fund testified on behalf of Bloomberg and changing the law so he could run for a third term, right after that, Mayor Bloomberg, Michael Bloomberg, gave $10 million to the Doe Fund. Oddly, the mayor doesn't have a lot of critics. So again, he ran for New York City mayor as a Republican, and then he switched to an independent in the middle of his running. The next year, he gave a million dollars to the state Senate Republican Party. And he gave, in particular, to four state senators, four Republicans. And they, they've come out and endorsed him as well. Are you seeing a trend here? Now, I got to take a break here. It's not, it's, he's not just throwing money around at politicians, right? Here's a million, here's a million, here's a million, endorse me. It's not just that. I'll take a break here. We got more on this next. How has he got the Democratic establishment to stay silent against him? And look at how he's paying individual people. And nothing like this has ever happened. And it's happening right now. And I don't think enough people are seeing it clearly. The question is, will Democratic voters let this guy buy their vote? We got more on this next. True story, Mike Slater, spread the word. All right, Senator Sanders, we've got to keep this going. So we're talking about Mayor Bloomberg and how he is buying, trying to buy his way to the presidency. This is an, it's unprecedented. No one's ever done anything like this. No one could ever do anything like this. No one's ever run for president with a net worth of $6.3 billion. I think he's the eighth richest person in America, right? So he is buying endorsements and trying to buy votes. And he has had a long history of doing this as well, which we outlined with politicians and with organizations. But now I want to take it a step further. He's not just 
throwing money around to politicians and charities to try to support him. His campaign rallies, he had a big rally in Philadelphia a couple weeks ago. It was catered with free wine. He had an open bar at his campaign rally on a university campus. Okay, so I mean, this never happened. There's never been a campaign with an open bar. So remember that when you see huge crowds at his events. Let, let, listen, Bloomberg is not getting large crowds because of his thrilling rhetoric. This is a clip of his opening big grand campaign speech. So check out that. More than plans, I offer the leadership to turn plans into reality, to roll up my sleeves, to motivate our country, to unite and rebuild America and make it fairer and better. I'm ready to get to work, so let's get it on. That was the ending of his opening <laughs> campaign speech, okay? So people aren't going for the thrilling rhetoric. They're going for the booze. All right, so he's throwing, he's throwing money around there. Uh, how about his campaign staff? So a field organizer usually makes about $42,000. His field organizers are starting at 72. His state political directors are making $12,000 per month. Press secretaries, every state, $10,000 a month. His national political director is making $30,000 a month. Caleb Hull says, I can't emphasize enough how insane these salaries are. His campaign staff, they all get new MacBook Pros and iPhone 11s on their very first day, and they receive three catered meals a day. Here, here's, an, here's an interesting thing he's doing. He's not raising money from rich people, obviously, right? He doesn't need any more money. One of the richest people in the world. But what he's doing is two things. First, he's asking rich people to not give to other candidates, right? He's asking them to sit out completely. Or he's asking rich people to donate to the Democratic Party. And you wonder why the Democratic Party has changed their debate rules to allow him to be on stage. It's because Bloomberg is funneling donors to give to the Democratic Party, which the Democratic Party can then spend on other races. And he always frames this as like a noble thing he's doing. Uh, he did the same thing with this when he first ran for mayor. He accepted no public campaign funds, right? Oh, I'm so noble, I'm not going to accept anybody. But then he outspent his opponent five to one with his own money because he has tons of it. So where other candidates only have a really, like, well, more than ever, but nothing compared to him, the, because they only have so much money, they, they have to go to the CNN town halls, right? They have to take any interview they can get just to get airtime. Bloomberg doesn't have to do that. He can avoid everyone all the time. He just pays for more ads. He can be everywhere without having to face any scrutiny for anything ever. No one's ever been able to do anything like this. And I don't think people can, I don't think people in the media can wrap their heads around this. I think people in the media, maybe they see it happening because they know he's rich and all this stuff, but no one, there's no playbook for this. So no one yet has said, hey, are we, are we okay with, with having a multi-billionaire just straight up buying loyalty? Paying the Democratic Party to change the debate rules and I don't know, open bar at his campaign rallies. And I think the media's okay with it because, well, first they don't have a play before, so they can't really think about it. But um, it's money. They get it. They get all the money. Tons and tons of money. More money than anyone has ever run for president has ever had, not even close. Michael Tracy put it nicely. He said, Mike Bloomberg is currently executing what is perhaps the most brazen, systematic, oligarchic takeover of electoral politics in U.S. history, and TV pundits think they're going to browbeat left-wing populists like Bernie supporters into getting on board with this? He's even buying his memes. Mayor Bloomberg is buying his memes. This is from the Daily Beast. For a fixed $150 fee, the bl I, that's not even right, because it starts at $150, and I'll get to that in a second. The Bloomberg campaign is pitching micro-influencers someone who has from 1,000 to 100,000 followers to create original content, quote, that tells us why Mike Bloomberg is the electable candidate who can rise above the fray, work across the aisle, so all Americans feel heard and respected. Are you kidding me? He's paying just regular people 150 bucks on Instagram? And some of these accounts that he's had, 
people have tweeted out support of him. They have like three million followers. So he's not paying them $150. He's paying them a ton of money to make memes in support of Michael Bloomberg. And for him, it's all pocket change. And no one's saying anything. It's crazy. What's Just read it. Just okay. Um, Mayor Michael Bloomberg is a. Tell me to look at the. Yeah, just. Okay. Uh, Mayor Michael Bloomberg is a visionary, independent-minded candidate for the future. You want to read this part too? Yeah, just down to the bottom. Okay. okay. Um, how much do we get? Do we get the 150? Yeah, plus a little. More? Yeah. Okay. I I want to be him. Really, that much? <laughs> okay, uh, I want to be him. Women want to be with him. And he's a lot taller than five foot four. Bloomberg2020.com. That's it? That's all we have? Wow. Okay, okay. Okay. Uh, listen, I don't care <laughs> that he's doing this. Like, I, I don't care because he's a terrible candidate. And I would I, actually I would care I would care more if he was actually a really good candidate because then it would be like a one-two punch. But he's got he's got no two punch, right? He's a terrible candidate. And just I'm imagining Trump and Mini Mike up on a debate stage. Like he can't buy his way out of debating. And he's got major political baggage, even himself. So I don't really care about all this, but it's pretty wild that the Democratic Party's letting it happen. Uh, so be on the lookout for other candidates to really start freaking out about it, because all they do is raise money it's like that's that's why running for office is the worst thing ever because all you do is raise money from a local all the way to presidential like i would never there's a million reasons why i would never run for congress or anything but one of the reasons why is i hate asking people for money <laughs> I, I just, like to go to a bunch of people and be like hey give, write me a check for a thousand like I, I i could never ever do that and these presidential candidates like they don't i don't think anyone likes doing Right? They constantly go into these fundraisers begging people to give to their campaign. That's a, that's a, really, it's a shameless gig. Right? It's a dirty, shameless gig. But they do it. They have to do it. you got to do it in order to get to run. But then Bloomberg swoops in and outspends them 100 to 1. I think all the other candidates are going to be super ticked off, super jealous. But man, does money talk. It buys endorsements. It silences critics. Will it buy votes? We'll find out in just a few weeks. Coming up next, we're going to talk about coronavirus. And have you seen these videos of, of China where people in hazmat suits, government people in hazmat suits, are ripping regular people out of their apartments to bring them to quarantine? Crazy stuff. So I saw those videos, and I'm like, oh, geez, could anything like that ever happen in America? What, what's the legal restrictions on our government uh, so that that doesn't happen? Or are there any at all? We'll talk about that next. True story. Mike Slater, spread the word. Hey, Senator Crusaders, I, uh, we talked about coronavirus a while ago. I'm not too worried about it yet. Maybe I should be, but, but I'm not. Um, what I was concerned about, though, is this video I saw out of China where it looked like, they can't really trust much video out of China, right? But it looked like the gov government officials wearing the big hazmat suits pulling people out of their apartments who the government said uh, might have coronavirus, and um, the people either thought they didn't have coronavirus or either way, did not want to be ripped from their home and put into a quarantine. Now imagine if they didn't have coronavirus, really, and then they're put into a quarantine site with a bunch of people who do have the coronavirus. That's problematic, and I thought, geez, what if that happened here? What if something like that, what if we had a big, massive, like a coronavirus outbreak here in America with you know, tens, hundreds of thousands of people getting sick, what could the government do? We're not a communist country, so can the government just come in and, and rip people from their homes and put us into quarantine hospitals? I don't know. I think so, so let's talk about it. Andrew Staltman's here. He's a Northwestern adjunct professor. Mr. Staltman, how are you, sir? I'm well. How are you? Good. I'm glad you're here. So uh, uh, let's start just your general take on coronavirus in general. Like, are you worried? Should I be a little more worried? Where, where's your take on that first? 
so far, Trump has taken some pretty good measures to make certain it doesn't spread here in the United States. Now, of course, we have had some confirmed cases. Uh, so, I, look, the flu is still a much bigger threat to most Americans than the coronavirus, but it's certainly something that needs to be on our radar. I think that's fair uh, and sensible. Okay, so what is the federal government's legal obligation and limits when it comes to quarantine? I think the American people will be shocked to learn how draconian the powers of the federal government and also the state government can be with respect to a pandemic like this. There are near dictatorial powers our federal government and state governments have to quarantine people, to place people in isolation, to require medical examinations, to literally drag people out of their home and put them in a place that they don't want to be at. And the Supreme Court has looked at this. Now, the Supreme Court hasn't looked at it in a long time. It's been 1915 since the last time they examined it. But as of Whoa. now, the leak powers of the state and federal government are almost unlimited to prevent this sort of disease from spreading. Wow, no kidding. So it is like that video I saw out of China, like that could happen. Unbelievable. And you know, if people start freaking out and panicking, then then people would like encourage that type of behavior, right? I mean, all, all bets are off when people freak out over like a, a virus like this. So what, Absolutely. can you talk about that 1915 one real quick? What, what was the 1950? Was that the Spanish flu? That's a sp Spanish flu, yeah, that's exactly it. And, and there were draconian our federal and state governments took, and just like now, people were complaining, and, and it got pretty bad. And the Supreme Court said, look, all of this is predicated off of the Commerce Clause of the United States Constitution and also the state police powers under the self-defense rubric that these states have the ability to defend their residents by imposing these draconian-like measures on the residents. What was that last week you said, a self-defense measure? What was that? I, yeah, under the state powers, the state has the ability uh, to pass laws and to take measures under a self-defense concept. And you're like, well, that's interesting. This is a virus. But if you think about it, people have the right to defend themselves. The state has the right to defend its residents. So you can take people kicking and screaming out of their home who don't even have the virus, put them in a place they don't want to go and make them stay there for 7, 14, 21 days. Whoa. What is the Commerce Clause's connection? How do they connect the... Because obviously there's nothing in the Constitution about uh, quarantine, right? So how, where does it come from out of the Commerce Clause? It comes out of the Commerce Clause insofar as anything that can potentially cross state lines, the federal government has the right to regulate. And if you think about it, a virus very clearly can go across state lines. Now, what's interesting, though, is just remember, the federal government's power is somewhat limited, really, with respect to the borders. And we kind of see what Trump is doing right now, right? He's already imposed a quarantine on people who have been to that section of China where the disease has spread, and he has them quarantined for 14 days. But the state government's powers are almost unlimited when it comes to protecting its residents. And believe it or not, it would be the state that takes the lead on the protection to making certain that this virus doesn't spread. Interesting. Okay, so let's be specific because you mentioned Trump twice. And again, I haven't really given this enough thought. So uh, so I live in San Diego. So Miramar, the, our base, our Marine base is right down there. So uh, a couple of airplanes have come in from China with American citizens on it who have been to Wuhan or certain areas, and they're now, they, they have to be quarantined at Miramar, at the military base. So if you're that person, what do you do? Like, what, 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 what legal recourses do you have at all? Do you have anything? None. I mean, none. These people have to take it. There's nothing they can do. If they challenge it in court, good luck. Because, uh, again, the case law on this is old, but it's still a good case law. And it's from the United States Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court is very, very reluctant to get involved with issues related to protecting the health and safety of the Americans. And if you think about it, any legal challenge would also take a long time. And by that point, yeah. we'll either know, oh, are they wow. sick so or not sick? The people at Miramar, for instance, are they there because of California or are they there because of the federal government? Federal government. 
When it comes to people okay. coming into America, it's the federal government and the CDC that are calling the shots. Got it. Okay, so how do you personally feel about that? Hey, look, I, I, I mean, I'm a civil liberties sort of guy, but in the same sense, we can't have this thing spreading. I was gonna say like the Ebola virus, but why don't we just stick yeah. with the coronavirus to yeah. big parts of the United States population? So are these, uh, you know, are these restrictions uh, problematic in one sense? Yes, but come on, we gotta protect American citizens. And if we can do stuff now to nip this in the bud to make certain that it doesn't spread, Let's do it. And, and and remember, we're a whole heck of a lot more sensitive today than we were back in the early 1900s. I have a feeling Americans will be extraordinarily upset when they fully learn the full scope of the United States federal and state government to make sure this thing doesn't spread. Yeah, I think that's right. That's why I'm glad you're here, that we, at least we're prepared that that's like the starting, that's a potential. Uh, yeah. for our government. What do, you, what do you think about, and I, I don't know if there's a precedent for this back in 1915. I've seen videos as well, and again, it's commie China, you can't, but they've set up like these giant tunnels that people have to walk through, and you're getting sprayed with chemicals that are probably gonna kill you uh, in a couple years from cancer. And also I've seen people in, like in colleges, and they're just like in the library, and some guy comes in with a hazmat suit, and this giant spray gun just, whoosh, just showering the whole place with some sort of pesticide or something. What, like can the federal government just do that without people saying, ah, I don't really want that? Hey, look, the Supreme Court looked at it and they ruled that the powers are almost unlimited. I mean, as of right now, the Supreme Court has addressed issues like can the government come and grab somebody who doesn't want to leave their house, take them out, give them medical examinations, check to see whether they have it and make them take certain medications? So the answer to that is yes. Now, what you just described, it's obviously different than what the Supreme Court has ruled on in the past, but given the discretion federal and state governments have to protect their citizens i have a feeling the supreme court would say a-okay wow okay what based on what we know with the commies in china right they they can first of all they don't have to share information with the world and they can do whatever they want what's your analysis and your take on how china has handled this and maybe things is there anything that they do that we can't that our federal government can't do how about that <sighs> That's a good question. So far, what they've done is they basically quarantined an entire region, right, of the country. What is it, some 50 million people or 40 yeah. to 50 million people? That's extraordinary. Has the United States government ever done that? No, but given the broad discretion I, that the governments have, I have a feeling it would be okay to do that. And, and obviously some of this is troubling. You know, you don't like to see people coming into a library and spraying it. You don't like to see people forced not to move, but it's for the greater good of society. So yeah. I, it's, it's fascinating to me. And, and now China is attacking President Trump because they're saying, gee, don't impose a travel ban. Don't prevent people from coming here. Well, guess what? President Trump has a duty to protect Americans. So some of it may be somewhat draconian, but guess what? You gotta protect the American citizens. Yeah, wow. Well, okay, last question for you, because you're, you're a securities fraud uh, professor, uh, attorney. Um, can you even begin to describe if there's something like a worst case scenario, corona outbreak in America, something like that, what that would do to our markets and our economy and our and just people's, <laughs> Just our culture, like, could you imagine the scope of panic? How, how would you describe that? Extraordinary. And, and I'll be real curious to see what happens in China with respect to their economy. I mean, granted, so far, it's only 40 million people who have been de facto quarantined, but there are restrictions placed on other parts of the country as well. I'll be real impact it has on their economy and therefore the stock market and therefore America's companies and America's stock market, which are all intertwined with China, which is what the second biggest economy right up there with the United States. So if it happens in the United States, I would expect a, a, a significant haircut on the market. I don't know, tough to say five, 10, 15, 20%, but you can't have, have big parts of quarantine and shut down without it adversely affecting the economy. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, interesting, Andrew, <laughs> Professor. Uh, I wasn't sure how draconian the federal government's rules are, but uh, thanks for setting that standard as we as we 
go on and learn more about this. Pretty crazy. So thank you for your insight. Professor Stoltman, where can I learn more about you, sir? Where can people learn more about you? Uh, Stoltmanlaw.com, and don't go near that military base in San Diego, okay? Stay away. I drive, I drive, we drive through it, but there's fences. I, hopefully the fences protect us. I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> Professor, appreciate your time, sir. Anytime. Thank you. True story. Mike Slater, we're coming up. Hey, Senator Crusaders. I just saw this from Trump's uh, Twitter feed. Uh, can't buy this, Bloomberg. The Daytona 500 is a legendary display of roaring engines, soaring spirits of the American skill, speed, and power. But NASCAR fans never forget that no matter who wins the race, what matters most is God, family, and country. The cars will take to the track for the start. Tires will screech, rubber will burn, Fans will scream and the great American race will begin. For 500 heart-pounding miles, these fierce competitors will chase the checkered flag. To all of the drivers, technicians, and pit crews here today, good luck and may the best team win. Gentlemen, start your engines. The 62nd Daytona 500 is underway. <laughs> That's awesome. Can't like that. You can't beat that. I was at Monster Jam this weekend with my three-year-old, and there was a point when Megalodon and and uh, Gravedigger were flying in the air, and they crashed into each other, and they're falling, and things are on fire, and everything, and, I, and everyone's freaking out. I was like, Aah! my three-year-old's like jumping up and down, and I looked around, and I was like, everyone here's voting for Trump, right? Are we all? We're all good here. Like we're <laughs> we're in Petco Park here. There's like thirty thousand people. Like this, we're all voting for. I know we're in San Diego, we're in California, but like we're all Trump supporters, right? Moments like that, man, that is so good. So this is our working theory, and I know I mentioned this earlier. So I want to break this down a little bit more here, and we're going to give tons of examples of this as the campaign goes on. My working theory here throughout the primaries, uh, and I'm stealing it. I'm stealing it from Car Carpe Donctum, Donctum, Carpe Donctum on Twitter, this guy who makes a ton of memes that the president uses. Uh, he wrote this a couple weeks ago. He said, Joe Biden is quite literally the embodiment of what Democrats believe Donald Trump is, but isn't. A corrupt, bitter, creepy old man with dementia, a man with below average intelligence and thin skin who lashes out at anyone that questions him. Biden, he yells at women, calls people names, challenges them to physical contests, or threatens to beat them up. He has old ties to racism that he covers up with, I got a ton of black friends. His family's a mess, and he's constantly lying about his accomplishments. And again, the, the Democratic Party is literally running their own projection of Trump. I think that is so spot on. But it's not just Biden. It's more than that. Let's back it up for a second. So first, in, just in your life, Think of something, think of a characteristic, and this could go down a long, long road that we don't need to go down right now. But think of a characteristic of your parents that you did not particularly care for growing up, and now you're starting to see it in yourself. Now you're starting to see you do it, right? I've learned the worst thing you can say to your wife is, is uh, uh, you're becoming your mother, right? That's not, right? and my, mom, my wife and my mom, they, mother, they love each other. But I just like the, like oh that's a lot like your your uh, your mom like ooh ooh be very very careful right so we become even that thing we hate about our parents we become that so that's like so that's a pretty universal thing but even beyond familial ties when you're filled with hate it consumes you so entirely it consumes all your thoughts and therefore all your actions you very quickly become that thing you hate. So I'll give you a, a, a side example of this. Uh, so this is Bernie, uh, uh, Brian um, St Steltler, Stetler or whatever from CNN. He was uh, one of the people in the media just falling over themselves in praise of Michael Avenatti, creepy porn lawyer, 
who now is going to jail for a long time for trying to extort Nike of $25 million. But someone, it was like Anna Navarro, whatever, uh, said he's li like the Holy Spirit. And every political show, oh, he's Trump's worst nightmare. Uh, he's going to be Trump's 2020 challenger. He's going to save our democracy. Someone made a supercut of all this stuff, and it's brilliant. It's like five minutes of the media just, just, just gushing all over Michael Avenatti. Now, Stetler, whatever his name is, uh, a little bit to his credit, on his show, he asked someone uh, if his praise for Avenatti went too far. And the guy had a really good answer. The guy said that Trump has Trumpified his opposition. Now, he's a little bit off here because it's not Trump's fault, like it's the person's fault. So it's not that Trump is Trumpifying, it's that the people are trying to be Trump. But in general, he's right. Avenatti was in some ways very similar to Trump in the way that Avenatti knew how to court attention at all costs. Uh, pretty soon here, we're gonna start uh, cracking that open the uh, 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene which we used a ton in the 2016 campaign to explain pretty much everything that Donald Trump did. Uh, but one of, the, one of the laws is to court attention at all costs. And Michael Avenatti, Trump's obviously brilliant at that. He just saw the Daytona 500, but uh, he was great with that during the 2016 campaign. And Michael Avenatti was really good at that too, getting cable news attention. And people on the left, they grabbed onto Avenatti because they saw that and they thought that he could beat Trump at his own game, right? They all want to beat Trump. They can't beat it in their game. So they think, oh, I'm going to try to beat Trump at his game. But they can't do that either. Right? So Trump would call Jeb, you know, weak and slow and soft and low energy. So Jeb tried to punch back. And then Trump goes, oh, look, you're some tough guy, Jeb. Look at you, big tough guy. Marco Rubio had this super embarrassing rally near the end of his uh, presidential run where he tried to do this whole stand-up bit, making fun of Trump and his tiny hands and fake tan and all that stuff. And it just looked ridiculous. So they all try to play Trump's game, but they can't. So the left, they're looking for someone who can beat Trump. That's like top prior number one, someone who can beat Trump. And they think that the only way to beat Trump is to find their own version of Trump, which means they're gonna put up what, what they hate, right? So they look at Trump, they hate him. They think, oh, we gotta beat him, which means we have to be him, which means we gotta put up people that we also hate, right? But here's the thing, they're not actually becoming Trump. They're becoming what they think Trump is. They're becoming their own projection of Trump. So we talked earlier about Bloomberg. Uh, Bloomberg, I think, is an even better example than Biden. Uh, the, um, when Trump was starting to run, right, one of the early attacks on Trump was that he was, he was super rich and out of touch. So they put up Bloomberg? <laughs> who has a, a net worth of $63 million, but more than that is the most unrelatable person alive. All right, check out this Bloomberg clip from one of his rousing campaign speeches the other day. Now, if I were for Texas, I might say he's, Donald Trump is scared as a cat at the dog pound. But since I'm from New York, I put it this way. We're scaring the living hell out of him. And we're just starting right now. Think the people at the Daytona 500 are going to get fired up by by that speech? Scared? If I if I was in Texas, <laughs> I'd say uh, he's scared like a cat at the dog pound. Ted Cruz mocked him on Twitter and said, uh, "Nobody in Texas says that." Translation: Somebody told me that lots of people in flyover country have animals. So let me try to say something folksy about animals so the yokels think I can relate. Listen, when you're getting charisma advice from Ted Cruz, so the left also for four years has uh, talked about how stupid Trump is, right? <clears throat> He's such an idiot. His supporters are idiots. He's an idiot. He has no idea who certain world leaders are, where certain countries are, all this stuff. Check out this video. This is from Telemundo. They asked the Democratic candidates, uh, not... <laughs> Super difficult question. They asked him who the president of Mexico is. Do you know his name? I forgot. Tom Steyer dijo no recordar el nombre del mandatario, mientras que Amy Klobuchar dijo que sabe quién es el presidente de México, pero admitió no saber su nombre. But can you tell me his name? Uh, no. Pete Buttigieg fue el único que pudo nombrar a Obrador. Can you tell me who the president of Mexico is? Yeah, President Luis Obrador, I hope. Uh, uh, Obrador, I hope. Uh, they don't even know his name. This, this is the Klobuchar interview 
uh, in English. Uh, this is after the reporter asked her like three times what you know about the president of Mexico. And Klobuchar just gave like these ridiculous politician non-answers. And, and here's how it ended. I, I'm sorry to ask okay. this, but do you know who he is? Do you know his name? Yeah, yeah. I, um, I know that he is the Mexican president. But so. can you tell me his name? Uh, no. So. Don't you think it would be important if you're running for president to know who the president of Mexico, the country to the south of the United States, is? Yes. Because He's, yeah, yes, she says yes. I do think that would be important. So I just want to be clear. After pretending to talk about him, the president of Mexico, for a minute, the interviewer says, do you know who he is? And she says, I know that he's the Mexican president. So the question is, do you know who the president of Mexico is? And she says, I know he's the Mexican president. <laughs> Isn't that fantastic? Now, what's amazing about this interview is that would never happen on CNN or MSNBC or, or any newspaper. They would never ask that question or publish it or print that or show that. It takes Telemundo to do it because their loyalty isn't so much to the Democratic Party as much as it is to their Hispanic uh, list of viewers. And how embarrassing is that? That's not a gotcha question, right? That's not like, oh, do you know the president of Tajikistan? Or that's not, it's the president of Mexico. So my point with that example is, after all these years of calling Trump stupid, he doesn't know anything, they've become their own projection of Trump. Biden is a bully, Bloomberg is an out-of-touch billionaire, and the rest of the Dems don't even know who the world leaders are. They don't even know what the president of Mexico is. So keep up the great work, Dems. Slater Crusaders, we'll be back tomorrow. Have a great rest of your day. True story, Mike Slater, spread the word.